Hi, this is Zara Rawlinson from GNS Science, giving you an overview and update of the Hawke's Bay 3D aquifer mapping project using SkyTem, which is an airborne time domain electromagnetic system. The project is funded by the Provincial Growth Fund, Hawke's Bay Regional Council and GNS Science, and is undertaken in collaboration with the Aarhus University, Hydrogeophysics Group and Project House. So I'm going to give you an overview of the project and SkyTem, then look at data collection and coverage, some of the preliminary results, the processing and inversion steps, as well as a quick look at the Bakawa resistivity model, some of the supporting data sets, and the start of the Bakawa interpretation. So this is a three-year project. It started about a year ago and we've still got two years to go. The basic workflow of the project is a SkyTem data collection, processing of that data, developing resistivity models, and then doing hydrogeological interpretation modeling. There's three areas that are covered, which you can see here on the right, the Hirotonga Plains, the Ruatanifa Plains, and the Bakawa and Otana Basins. Each area has a different level of funding in the project in terms of how far we're going with the hydrogeological interpretations. So the Bakawa and Otana Basins are having a basic hydrogeological interpretation. For the Ruatanifa Plains, we're doing a more advanced hydrogeological interpretation, as well as updating the existing Lake Brog geological model. And for the Hirotonga Plains, similarly, we're doing a more advanced hydrogeological interpretation, doing an update of the existing Lake Brog geological model, and also updating the numerical groundwater models. So this is the SkyTeam system. It's a helicopter with a fixed loop towed beneath it that flies about 30 to 50 meters above the ground. It generates a magnetic field, which sets up eddy currents in the ground, and then they generate a secondary magnetic field, which is recorded. So the helicopter flies along flight lines, collecting samples with high lateral resolution. Each sample is effectively a 1D sounding. And then you've got about 200 meter spacing between the flight lines. The benefit of the SkyTem system is that it's a dual moment system. And that means that you get low moment voltage, which is shown here. And that gives you information about the near surface. And you also get high moment voltage, which gives you information about the deeper subsurface. We convert this voltage data into an electrical resistivity model. So that basically tells you how easy or how difficult it is for the electric current to flow through the subsurface. The reason that's important is that the electromagnetic waves are sensitive to rock type, porosity, permeability, clay content, moisture content, and fluid properties. And all of these are related to aquifer properties. So you can see some examples here of some different sediments and rock types. And you can imagine that all of these are gonna have quite different resistivity signals. So data was collected in January, February earlier this year. The Hawke's Bay Regional Council communication team did a really great job keeping the public informed. So they had a web page with details and frequently asked questions. They undertook a launch event, radio adverts, flyers, etc. They also set up a help phone line um, if anyone had any questions. And they did daily Facebook updates. So this is an example on the right of one of those Facebook updates where each day they showed the area that was planned to be surveyed that day. And this worked really well and in general we had really positive feedback from the public about the communication. So in about one month, close to 8,000 line kilometres of SkyTem data was collected. And you can see here the black lines are showing where we collected that over the Hedotonga Plains. So although parallel flight lines are planned, you can see that they do end up a little bit wiggly because we're doing things like flying around houses and infrastructure. You can also see that we don't fly through towns because of the infrastructure, so those are holes in the data set. On the left, you can see the data coverage over the Rotanifa Plains, and on the right, over the Pukawa and Atana Basins. And you can see that there was a lot less infrastructure to avoid in these areas. This is just showing on the right the Hirotonga data set coloured by flight. Um, so you can see kind of how the helicopter worked in terms of doing different sections each day. If we zoom in, you can get an idea about the real high density of the data set that we've got and also how it works when you're close to town. So we actually went really close before the helicopter turned around and went the other direction. Um, so although we've worked with airborne electromagnetic data sets before and ground electromagnetic data sets, this is the first time that we'd work with the specific SkyTem equipment. And so four geophysicists at GNS um, got SkyTem specific processing and inversion training from the Aarhus University Hydrogeophysics Group who developed the equipment originally. And it worked out that we ended up doing this during COVID lockdown. 
And this is just a photo uh, because we we're working really early mornings uh, for a while to work with the Denmark guys because of the time difference. So this is showing an example of some of the preliminary information that's provided by SkyTeam Australia, who collected the data. So here you can see the high moment voltage data, the low moment voltage data, and then the preliminary resistivity model. What you can notice here is that this is actually noise, and you can see that this is right on the edge here close to the town. So there's obviously some infrastructure noise there. This hasn't been removed by automatic uh, procedures. And so what we need to do is actually go in and manually clean the data to remove such noise signatures. The reason that that's important, as you can see here in the resistivity model, um, where we've got this noise, it actually shows up as a shallow conductor and this is actually a false um, reading. So this is an error in the model. Um, so we need to be really careful, go through and remove all of these things so we don't end up with such errors in the modeling. This is just an example of an area where we have uh, less noisy data. So you can see the high moments looking really smooth, same with the low moment, and then the inversion model is looking like this. Um, the other thing you can see here is the depth of investigation uh, we calculate, and that tells us basically how deep we trust the data. And that's shown here where it's blanked out in white. Another thing this image shows on the left here, you can see the image is displaying basically 1D profiles. And that's actually what we're getting is the helicopter is collecting these 1D soundings along the flight path. So this is sort of a true representation of the data set, but then we can also do obviously an interpolation between all the data. So keeping in mind um, that this data I'm showing you now hasn't been cleaned for noise. I'm just gonna show you some of the preliminary resistivity information. This is a map at a depth of 20 meters. And one thing is that we're seeing some features we expect to see. So here in blue, we're seeing areas where we expect to see young gravel sediments. So that's great. Now, if we just look through some different depths, um, you can see how that varies. So if we just focus maybe on this um, unconfined system here where we have blue and green at two meters depth, you can see how it changes at seven meters depth, at 12 meters depth, to 20 meters depth, 50 meters depth, we're joining here, we're going into the basin. And then at 100 metres depth, you can see that unconfined area is no longer blue and it's really into the um, central part of the plains. Now, if we go to 160 metres, you can see that that's becoming sort of more scattered and same at 200 metres and 270 metres. Um, so that looks great that we're seeing sort of some of the variability that we're expecting to see in the areas based on existing information. Um, but being aware that there are still those errors present in the data sets, we need to undertake that manual processing. So what we're doing when we're going through the data, we're looking for things like this, galvanic couplings from grounded power lines and capacitive couplings, which has been blacked out in gray here already from things like buried cables. So we're working through the voltage data, looking at graphs of that data, and we're also using maps to compare. And on those maps, we have um, plots of things like power lines, roads, houses, so, and vineyards, so that we can compare the data set with where we're expecting to see noise sources. After we've done all that, we also undertake post-processing checks. Um, so we do some preliminary 1D inversions. We look at the data residuals, which is shown here in red. And where we have high data residuals, we can then go in and, and check our data again and say, hey, we missed some noise here. Um, and compare with also some maps um, of where we've got the road. So for instance, here, we've done after the processing, the post-processing and the QC checks, you can see here all the removed data in black is basically following all the roads and the kept data here is shown in blue. You can also see here the data residual from our smooth inversion model and you can see that we're getting a great data residual um, basically in all areas. Most of it's less than 0 0.6, um, all of it basically less than 1.4. So talking about the inversion, um, when we're doing those post-processing checks and we're just doing preliminary inversion models, we're doing what's called a laterally constrained inversion. And that basically sets up regularization uh, between 1D profiles along the flight lines. So it's telling it to be smooth along the flight lines, basically. When we do uh, the final inversion models, we're doing what's called a spatially constrained inversion or an SCI. And that sets up regularization parameters, not just along flight lines, but also between flight lines. Once again, saying, hey, be smooth between these 1D profiles and be smooth between these 1D profiles. Um, what we also have is this distance function, which tells it 
um, how tightly it wants to be smooth at varying distances. We've undertaken both smooth and sharpened versions, which I'll um, talk about next. And we've also used extra early time gates. So you can see here, we've got the high moment data, the low moment data. Typically from this black line to the left is data that gets chucked out because it still has some of the um, primary magnetic field uh, remnants within it. But there's some methods now to actually remove that primary magnetic field so that we can trust it a bit more. So looking at smooth and sharp, if we have a layered model and then we undertake a smooth model in blue, this is typically what it will look like. And then if we undertake a sharp model, this is sort of what it would look like in red. So the sharp model helps us get um, sharper constraints on geological boundaries, whereas a smooth model will sort of blur out those boundaries. So we're actually using both in this case, the sharp and the smooth to help with the interpretation. So this is sort of a pictorial example of the inversion model layer setup that we've done. We've got 35 layers. It starts with thin layers at the surface and the thickness increases with depth. So we start with a one meter thickness at one meters depth, two meter thickness at 10 meters depth, down to about 19 meters at 160 meters depth. And the final one is 50 me 59 meters thick at 500 meters depth. Deeper than 500 meters, we've got an infinite half space. The reason we've modeled all the way down to 500 meters is that in some areas in the Bakawa and Otana Basin data set, we were getting a depth of investigation down to 480 meters. And now talking about those early time gates. So we've used an additional five gates, gates three to eight. We've added 20% extra uncertainty to those gates, and this provides better near surface resolution. And we've also checked all the data residuals when we've done that, and we're getting good results in terms of those data residuals. Uh, what this does is it uses a primary field compensation high altitude test that was undertaken by SkyTeam Australia. So you can see here the, the primary magnetic field still apparent in the data. They estimate this primary field by doing a high altitude test and then they remove that signal um, from the data set. And this has just been published um, this year from the Hydrogeophysics Group uh, at Harris University demonstrating how this works. So I'm going to uh, show a quick example of a resistivity model for Pekawa. Um, I've simplified this into sort of some threshold values and it's got a 20 times vertical exaggeration. I'm just going to start with a depth slice at minus 200 meters above sea level, which you can see now. And then we're just going to step up through elevation. The blue is the low resistivity and the red is the high resistivity. You can see the blue and the green are areas where we have the mudstone ranges. And the red here, you can see a uh, um, river valley coming through. Same on the right here. Uh, we're now above the elevation of Lake Pakawa in the center here. And we're stepping now into these limestone ranges here in the red and these mudstone ranges shown in the blue and the green. We're also going to take some cross sections. So we're going to go through here, which is where Lake Pakawa is. And you can see here the limestone shown in the orange and how that's dipping down. And we've got these infilling sediments. Uh, we're also going to take another cross section roughly perpendicular to that one. And in this example, I've clipped the bottom with the depth of investigation, which is why you can see the bottom is quite jagged. Um, and the reason for that is that the depth of investigation can vary quite rapidly depending on the noise in the area. We're just going to take two more cross sections, um, one through this river valley, and you can see the mudstone is going to be in the, the blue and the green, so the basement, and then the river valley, you can see these higher value resistivity, you can see the um, depth change along that river, and then we're going to do a similar thing through this river valley here, and again, we're going to see a variation of the depth of that river valley and meeting into the mudstone basement. So in order to do interpretation, we need supporting data sets because absolute resistivity values um, vary a lot depending on your location because it's sensitive to so many different parameters. So first we pulled out seismic data. Um, the seismic reflection data is probably gonna be of most value when we're interpreting some of the deeper horizons because we're unlikely to have much lithological information down there. There's actually a lot of seismic reflection data in these areas, which is handy. And we've also pulled out some of the more modern uh, seismic reflection data in the Hirotonga area and reprocess this to focus it more on the near surface quaternary sediments. Um, and there's some more modern 2019 data in a, one area as well. 
There's also some existing direct current resistivity sounding from the 60s and 70s, you can see here. And the benefit of these um, are probably going to be to infill a few areas. We're probably going to have to cut out the Sky Team data because you can see here it's quite close to the town. There's also some existing ground team data sets in both areas. There's the Hawkesbury Regional Council borehole data set that we'll use, the petroleum wells, and there's also some deep research wells. And in a few places, we do have some um, high resolution geophysics borehole logs, such as density and gamma. So now we're looking at conversion from resistivity to a hydrogeological model. Just got sort of a cartoony example here on the left. This is a um, image from the Rotani Far Plains, one of those um, Sky Team preliminary images. And we've just done sort of an interpretation here saying, okay, if you had a first look, what would you call an aquifer, an aquitard, and a hydrogeological basement? Um, so that's sort of the most basic interpretation that you can look at. So if we look at the sky team data here, the KEP data is shown as the red lines, the boreholes in the area are shown as these black squares, and in the background we have an elevation model. One thing you can notice here is that our interpretation quality is going to be constrained by the location, depth, and the quality of our borehole data, and how that corresponds to the heterogeneity of the resistivity model. I'm just going to do a couple of quick examples through Pakawa. And this Gray line shows where we've taken the profile, and you can see that it cuts along a number of faults. And we're actually seeing the faults getting picked up quite well in these resistivity models. At the top, we're showing the sharp resistivity model, and at the bottom, the smooth resistivity model. And one thing you'll notice here is that the smooth resistivity model actually picks up those faults better because it is more sensitive to lateral variations, whereas the sharp resistivity model is more sensitive to vertical variations. So that's better for these sort of vertical geological boundaries, whereas down in the smooth, those sharp boundaries have been sort of blurred. So you can see, you can interpret sort of a lot, the top of the limestone, the base of the limestone, and we're also seeing some variability within the sediments above the limestone. So one other quick example is through Lake Pakawa. Um, we can see the top of the limestone again, and some variation in the sediments above the limestone. Also, there are some minor differences between the smooth and the sharp model, but they generally are quite consistent. And a final example through the Atana area, the blue here is this um, mudstone basement, which is quite low resistivity, and then you can see the sharp contrast with the gravel riverbed. So next steps, we're going to undertake drilling in the Hiratong and Ruatani Far Plains to collect some additional data sets, including things like grain size analysis to help us with some more advanced interpretations, complete the Hiratonga and Ruatani Far data processing and resistivity models, finish the hydrogeological interpretations, update the leapfrog geological models, and update the Hiratonga numerical groundwater models. Thanks. <laughs>